Hello and welcome to World Connect, your window to the world. In the next half an hour, we take you closer to the events that are making news across the world. News that tells the story of our times. Let's set the ball rolling with the focus of the show. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump clash in the first presidential debate. Verbal duel encompasses personal attacks to foreign policy. Clinton makes a mark with hold on facts and clearer vision. Major blow for Obama administration as US Congress overturns President's veto. Bill to sue Saudi Arabia over 9-11 attacks becomes a law. Saudi Arabia warns US of disastrous consequences. SARC summit postponed after most of the member states back out from the regional meet in Islamabad, scheduled for next month. Pakistan further isolated and embarrassed as world community asks it to act against terrorists on its own soil. Indian Army's surgical strikes killed scores of Pakistan-backed terrorists. Tributes pour in as former Israeli President Shimon Peres breathes his last at 93. One of the last founding fathers of Israel, Peres led his country towards peace and prosperity. And poignant love story of Katie and Dalton Prager becomes immortal, fighting a deadly infection throughout their lives. The American couple triumphs with their spirit of togetherness. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump went head to head earlier this week in the first presidential debate at Hofstra University in Hampstead in New York. They locked horns over issues of economy, taxation, race relations, terrorism, foreign policy and much more. The attacks went personal. Both tried their best to unsettle the others and emerge as the better choice for the White House. Most media analysis show that Clinton appeared better prepared than her Republican counterpart. The first presidential debate between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump was watched by 84 million people on US TV, breaking a previous record set by Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan's debate in 1980. The two contenders for the White House locked horns over wide spectrum of issues from economy and job to racism and police reforms, relations with allies in NATO to U.S. policy in the Middle East. Non-politician Trump's performance was characterized by his interruptions and reiteration of how America was in deep trouble and he was the best option at hand. Clinton, the seasoned politician, on the other hand, appeared in grip of her facts and policy and, in her own words, better prepared for the verbal duel. Most post-debate polls gave a thumbs up to the Democratic nominee in round one. Post-debate analysis dominated the news media. Washington Post said Donald Trump bombs on the ultimate reality TV show. According to Fox News, Trump could have done better had he not failed to exploit the email issue. Breitbart News website accused debate host Lester Holt of bias. It said Holt asked Trump tough questions that were straight from the Clinton campaign's talking points. New York Times played down the debate and said when just one candidate is serious and the other is a vacuous bully, the term loses all meaning. The debate was trending on Twitter in Russia, where some pro-Kremlin bloggers are hailing Trump's performance, admiring his lack of political correctness. The second debate will take place on the 9th of October at Washington University at St. Louis. The third debate will take place on the 19th of October at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. In addition to these two presidential debates, there will also be a vice presidential debate on 4th October at Longwood University in Virginia. Although the two contenders are expected to have a photo finish, these debates are likely to significantly influence who American voters choose on the 8th of November for the most powerful office in the world. The man who occupies the most powerful office in the world may sometime have to hear a no. In a historic legislation, both houses of US Congress came together to overturn President Obama's veto on a bill to sue Saudi Arabia over its alleged link to 9-11 terror attack. While Obama administration argued that the bill would be detrimental to U.S. national interests, for the families of 9-11 victims, passage of the bill was a deeply emotional moment. Experts say United States becomes both legally empowered and vulnerable to prosecution with this legislation. In a major setback for the Obama administration, the U.S. Congress has passed a bill into law allowing families of 9-11 victims to sue Saudi Arabia for its alleged backing of the attackers. Saudi Arabia has long denied any involvement in the attacks that killed nearly 3,000 people. Fifteen of the 19 men who carried out the 2001 attacks were Saudi nationals. 
Both houses of Congress overruled President Obama's veto over the bill. This is for the first time during his tenure that President Obama's veto has been overturned. The measure was passed unanimously by the two houses in May and September, but Obama vetoed it last Friday. This week, the Senate and the House of Representatives overrode the presidential veto. The House of Representatives voted 348 to 76 against it, just hours after the Senate rejected it 97-1, making the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act a law. The Obama administration had for long insisted that the bill would be detrimental to U.S. national interests and would create complications with its close partners. President Obama termed the move a mistake, saying it would set a dangerous precedent for individuals around the world to sue the U.S. government. Opponents of the law believe that it would also risk the U.S. government's assets held abroad. CIA Director John Brennan warned that the legislation would place U.S. government officials working overseas in grave danger. On the other hand, the proponents of the law argue that the legislation applies only to acts of terrorism that occur on U.S. soil. In an election year, senators and representatives are reluctant to oppose the emotive and popular measure. They supported it, cutting across party lines. This measure does not prejudge a verdict or issue a judgment. It gives both sides a fair day in court. And if the Saudi government had no involvement in 9-11, it has nothing to fear. But if it was culpable, it should be held accountable. That is the basic principle of this measure. Those against the law believe that in response, Saudi Arabia could pull billions of dollars from the U.S. economy. Saudi Arabia had already said that the U.S. had the most to lose if JASTA was enacted. Colombia is all set to vote on Sunday in a referendum whether to ratify or not the peace agreement with the FARC rebels. The deal was formally signed on Monday between Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos and the commander of Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, Rodrigo Londono Eshwari. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon along with Cuban President Raul Castro were among the international dignitaries who witnessed the signing ceremony. The deal now faces a referendum test for which President Santos has been campaigning hard, urging people to cast a yes vote. His plea faces tough opposition from a no movement led by influential former president Alavaro Urib. Recent surveys have predicted heavy support for a yes. To make the votes result binding, the winning side would need a majority of votes, cast and support totaling at least 13% of the country's 33 million eligible voters. Protesters took to streets in California's El Cajon this week, demanding a federal investigation into the police shooting and killing of an unarmed African-American. According to the local police, two officers responding to several calls for help in dealing with a mentally unstable person confronted the African-American man in his 30s walking in traffic. They opened fire after the man pulled an unspecified object from his pocket and took aim at them in a shooting stance. No weapon from Alfred Olango, however, was recovered from the scene. The mother of the victim said her son was having a mental breakdown and the police should have helped him instead of quickly opening fire. The incident is another addition of similar shootings in other US cities, sparking outrage over police brutality. Former Israeli President Shimon Peres died aged 93. He was celebrated around the world as a Nobel Prize winning visionary who united his country towards peace. His condition worsened following a major stroke a couple of weeks ago. The death of Shimon Peres marks the departure of the last major figure in Israel's founding generation and an end to the seven decade long illustrious political career. Tributes poured in for Shimon Peres. The former Israeli president and statesman who passed away on the 28th of September in a hospital near Tel Aviv. Perez was one of the last founding fathers of Israel. The 93-year-old Perez died two weeks after suffering a stroke. Born in 1923, Shimon Perez's political career spanned nearly seven decades. He served as the president once, from 2007 to 2014, and twice as the Labour Party's prime minister. He was also a part of a dozen cabinets, and has held the post of Defence Minister and Foreign Minister. It was as Foreign Minister that he played an important role in reaching the Oslo Peace Accord with Palestine in 1993. 
for which Perez was accorded the Nobel Peace Prize, along with Israel's late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Perez is remembered for his unceasing efforts towards peace. I will not give up my right to serve my people and my country, and I will continue to help build my country with a deep belief that one day it will know security and peace. Shimon devoted his life to our nation and to the pursuit of peace. He set his gaze on the future. He did so much to protect our people. He worked to his last days for peace and a better future for all. As Israel's president, Shimon did so much to unite the nation, and the nation loved him for it. Few people contributed as much to our people and to our state. Expressing grief over his demise, world leaders hailed the exemplary vision of Shimon Peres. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said, Perez remained an optimist even in the most difficult times about the prospects for reconciliation and peace. Calling Perez a dear friend, US President Barack Obama wrote, A light has gone out, but the hope he gave us all will burn forever. French President Francois Hollande said, Peace has lost one of its most ardent defenders. Age was not a factor as he continued to adapt to new technologies and become quite the social media enthusiast to remain close to the people. A short while before his stroke, Perez posted a message on Facebook urging people to use indigenously manufactured products. Known as one of the greatest statesmen in recent times, Shimon Perez leaves a powerful legacy behind, one of peace and more than that, an unfailing hope for a better world. The 19th SARC summit has been postponed. It was scheduled to be held at Islamabad on the 9th and 10th of next month. But given the decision of five of the eight member states of South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation to back out from the summit, the meet has been postponed. India, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan and Sri Lanka had already announced to abstain from the summit. The summit requires participation of all the member states. The development follows diplomatic efforts by India to isolate Pakistan internationally after 19 Indian soldiers were martyred in a terror attack in Uri in Jammu and Kashmir. The terrorists belonging to Jaish e Mohammed terrorist group had crossed over to India from Pakistan. Infuriated over Pakistan's constant support and backing to terror groups, operation from its soil and determined to teach Islamabad a lesson, India conducted surgical strike across its line of control and destroyed terror launch pads. Afghanistan and Bangladesh have supported India over the operation to target terrorists. Meanwhile, Pakistan was further isolated with US and Russia asking it to do more and concrete against terrorists. US also reprimanded Islamabad for its nuclear threat rhetoric. Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte appeared to liken himself to Nazi leader Adolf Hitler on Friday and said he would be happy to exterminate 3 million drug users and peddlers in the country. Over 3,100 people, mostly drug users and peddlers, have been killed since he took office on June 30 in police operations and in vigilante killing. Duterte's Holocaust comments have sparked outrage among the Jewish community who are reacting angrily over it. Syrian crisis continues to escalate as efforts for peace talks again appear to close to collapse. Russia and the US, who support opposition sides in the civil war, blame each other for the failure of the ceasefire agreement. While the U.S. said the talks with Russia over the issue are on the verge of being suspended, Russia says the U.S. is protecting Syria's jihadist groups. The Syrian army, meanwhile, is advancing on two Aleppo fronts. According to WHO reports, over 300 people have been killed in the city in the past few weeks. Meanwhile, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon announced he's setting up an internal board of inquiry to investigate the 19th of September bombing of an aid convoy in Syria that killed 18 people. Britain's Brexit dilemma continues as there is still no clarity on its formal separation from the EU. Meanwhile, the island nation is facing continuous pressure from the member states, particularly France, to speed up the exit process without any ambiguity. European Council President Donald Tusk has said that both sides could be on the negotiating table by early next year. For Britain, PM Theresa May must walk a tight rope between free market access in Europe and free movement of workers and services. Three months after Britain voted for its exit from the European Union, it is yet to specify the terms of separation. 
Other EU members have been calling upon Britain to prioritize the process, while voices within the EU administration urging it to conclude the process by 2019. Prime Minister Theresa May has ruled out giving formal notification this year of Britain's intention to leave the European Union under Article 50, but has also not given any clear guidance of her intentions beyond that. France has warned Britain against the talk's ambiguity. We will make sure to say to the United Kingdom that we want to work with them as our friends, but according to our very well-defined criteria. If there is any ambiguity about what we want to do together, that would not be good for the British economy or for the European economy. European Council President Donald Tusk and Irish Prime Minister Enda Kenny have both said that indications are there that talks could be launched in January or February of 2017. While underlining that Brexit means Brexit, Prime Minister May has assured British people to secure a settlement to address their concerns about free movement and trades in goods and services. Some believe that Britain is looking at the possibility of having an agreement with EU to have free trade access to the bigger market while putting controls on EU migration. Britain's International Trade Secretary Liam Fox echoed similar sentiments. However, where progress has stalled at the multilateral level, the UK must be ready to look at more bespoke, plurilateral and bilateral arrangements to ensure that the global marketplace remains fair and free. On the contrary, member countries have made it clear that for seeking free market access, free movement of workers along with the movement of capital, goods and services will have to be maintained. So it is not possible to get rights without obligations. And at least, I want to, to, to mention that necessarily, if you want to have access to the single market, you have to accept the four freedoms of the European Union. Once the exit process starts, Britain has an initial two-year period to negotiate its departure. But what shape does the actual Britain-European Union relationship take would only be clear once both the sides are on the negotiating table. A multi-billion pound deal to build Britain's first nuclear power station in decades was signed in London on Thursday. The contract was formally signed at a ceremony attended by Britain's business secretary, Greg Clark, French Foreign Minister Jean-Marc Arault and Chairman of CGN, Heyo. The project in Hinkley is proposed to be built by France's EDF and part funded by China. The plan, after facing uncertainty after the leadership change, was finally given the green signal earlier this month. The British government has said it would take a more cautious approach in future over foreign investment in big infrastructure projects. The Rosetta spacecraft ended its historic mission on Friday, crashing on the surface of the dusty icy comet it has spent 12 years chasing. The mission has provided insight into the early days of the solar system and captured the public's imagination. The spacecraft has stalked comet 67P churumov gerasimenko across more than 6 billion kilometers of space, collecting information on comets that will keep scientists busy for the next decade. Rosetta completed its freefall descent at the speed of a sedate walk, joining the probe fillet, which landed on the comet in November 2014, in what was considered a remarkable feat of precision space travel. The mission managed several historic firsts, such as getting a spacecraft into orbit around the comet and the unprecedented landing of a probe on the surface. A handful of previous spacecrafts had snapped pictures and collected data as they flew past their targets. Before reaching the surface and shutting down, Rosetta's instruments and camera relayed back data and images, giving scientists insight into the structure of the comet. The data will reveal information on the side walls of the comet crucial to understanding how they were formed. Let's now take a look at some other news that is making headlines around the world.
Katie and Dalton came together despite their chronic lung condition. The impending shadow of death and separation could not stop the love-struck couple from making the most of their short married life. It is a love story which is as heartbreaking as it is uplifting. Katie and Dalton Prager were a couple in their 20s very much in love. Being together was more important for them than anything else, even a chance at life. Both Katie and Dalton had cystic fibroid, a chronic genetic lung infection. Despite the medical condition, which does not permit them to be within the proximity of each other, the duo married. After living the life of their dreams for a few years, the two died days apart last week after failed lung transplants. The love story, which resembles the famed movie Fault in Our Stars, started off in 2009 when Katie, then aged 19, sent a Facebook message to Dalton after she came to know that he was a cystic fibroid patient too. Dalton, who started off his reply with, do I know you, later went on to walk the aisle with Katie and say, I do, within two years. It was a fairy tale life thereafter, as they got a home and adopted dogs as any other married couple would do. But their infections got better of them in 2014. From then, they had to spend more time apart in different hospitals awaiting their lung transplants, which failed eventually for both. They met each other in July this year when they celebrated their fifth wedding anniversary. For Dalton, it was Katie who saved him from himself and gave him a new meaning. Though the time they spent together was relatively short, it was the most precious time period for them. Katie, in an interview, said that she would rather have those five years in love and happiness than 20 years of not having anybody. They say age is no bar for starting new journeys. And what better way to enjoy the journey than on a bicycle? This is the fascinating story of Elena Galvez, a 90-year-old Chilean grandmother. At an age when people prefer a life of rest and care, Grandma Elena rides 30 kilometers on her bike every day to sell poultry and dairy products in the market. Age is just a number for this grandmother from Chile as she pedals hundreds of kilometers each day to sell her hen's eggs. 90-year-old Elena Galvez lives alone in a rural suburb. For a living, she collects eggs and whatever she can muster from her four cows and calf to sell in town. Her mode of transport is her sturdy bike. She easily pedals at least 30 kilometers each day through the rugged terrain of the Julian mountainside to the nearest town. And her daily commute does not tire her out like some seasoned riders, but excites her. Without my bicycle, I have no life. Recently, I went to Rengo on foot. My feet hurt so much, but when I'm on my bike, nothing hurts. I don't get tired on my bike. I'm happy on my bike. On foot, I can't go far. My feet end up hurting. Elena Galvez took up traveling in her cycle at the age of 47 and says her secret to health and longevity is the old-fashioned push bike. And not just that, she also does all the heavy work at her small farm, like tending to her animals. For this grand old lady, life is a beautiful adventure that one can easily ride through. And this brings us to the end of this edition of World Connect. Do send us your feedback on the show. You can write to us. Our email ID is worldconnect.ddnews at the rate gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook. And our Twitter handle is at the rate worldconnectdd. But before we leave, here are some glimpses of an air sports show in France. Paragliders, parachutists and hot air balloons woe audiences against the backdrop of the French Alps. Enjoy the visuals. Goodbye.